Lord Jesus, uh, you know what we have this morning, what we bring, and where we're coming from. And we believe, we are full of faith, that you, Jesus Christ, desire to reveal yourself to us this morning. That we might know you. That we might be confronted by you. That we might follow you. That we might be filled by you, changed by you until we look like you, act like you. Cause us this morning, Lord, to be able to hear your word, for your word to change us by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might be lights in the darkness, that we might be hearts of mercy in a dark and awful world. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, kids, I want you to, uh, to know something right up here at the beginning of the sermon. I want you to know that Jesus has come for me. For me. And I want you to do something. I want you to decide on your response to Jesus. In order to get a good idea of who Jesus is in the book of Mark, uh, I want to visit Daniel chapter 7 one more time. We read it for our call to worship. Daniel is uh, has been taken from his homeland, Israel. Uh, he has been the conquering king, took him and his friends, and they are now in bondage, serving in the land of Babylon, And while he's there, God gives him dreams and visions. He talks with angels, and he writes a bunch of stuff down. The nation of Judah had long been awaiting that Davidic king who was going to come and make everything right, like David did, like God promised. And it just didn't happen, and a lot of people were really confused. And here... Daniel has in his dream a solution that God presents to him for all of the messianic expectations. Now what you need to know is that earlier in the chapter, uh, an an earlier part of the dream is all these nasty beasts uh, that are are, uh, a problem. And they're causing a lot of problems on the earth and they can't be conquered. Uh, But then Daniel sees something. In verse 13, uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 13 of the book of Daniel, he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. So if you can picture it, in his dream, coming up on the clouds is someone who looks like a dude, a guy. He looks like the son of a man, just a, a regular person. He's, he's coming on the clouds, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This, this son of man, riding on the clouds, goes right up to the very throne room of the Ancient of Days. And he was presented before the Ancient of Days. And to him, to this son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Now, to Daniel and the uh, ancient uh, people of Judah, now in Babylon, they are called Jews. This is an incredible promise. This is not just a Davidic dynasty over their land, but rather, this is a promise of someone who can have dominion over all of these beasts, and his dominion is not just in the land of Israel, it's everywhere. It's all peoples, all nations, all languages serving him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It's not one that can be broken apart. It's not one that is susceptible to sin and uh, the powers of these beasts. It's, It's everlasting. It shall not pass away. His kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. By the time of Jesus, 
hundreds and hundreds of years later. This passage was something that uh, the Jewish people, especially the scribes and the Pharisees, would have been looking for, waiting for, and quite frankly, confused about. Now, we all know that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, and he makes no bones about it, but one incredible thing that, that he, a claim that he makes is not just that he is the Messiah, but that he is, in fact, the Son of Man, who's bringing a kingdom. And if you remember, back in uh, chapter 1, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came and he proclaimed, in verse 15 of chapter 1, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in this good news. This kingdom, this everlasting dominion, this kingdom which will have power over the beast, it's here, it's right now. Turn away from evil, repent, believe in this good news. I think that Mark is writing this gospel in order to present us with a picture of Jesus that might not be as familiar as you think. In Mark's gospel, things move so very quickly, and I think more than all of the other gospels, it is highly charged with emotion. Not just messianic expectation, not just the kind of political fervor that we get, will get a feeling for, uh, get reacquainted with again this year in 2020, as people start really believing in things and, 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 and yelling and screaming, all of that too. But there was spiritual work going on that could not be faked, that could not be pretended. These beasts, these demonic beasts, are all over the place in the book of Mark, and the Son of Man, he's dealing with them. And the people are like, could this be the guy? That verse in Daniel is so mm, shadowy, nebulous. Who is this Son of Man character? We know so little about him, except that he's going to ride on the clouds, you know, he's going to have this kingdom, he's going to this and stuff, but what, is, what does it look like when he's actually among us? In Mark chapter 2, um, right after Jesus has healed this leper and told the leper, uh, go and show yourself to the priest, but he doesn't obey. He goes and tells everybody, now Jesus can't go from town to town in order to preach the good news of the kingdom. So he has to stay out in the wilderness, and the people have to come to him. And after some time, uh, he goes back to his headquarters in Capernaum, where he called his first four disciples, and they lived. So this is probably Peter's house, is his home base. So chapter 2, verse 1. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. I just find it interesting that Jesus is always preaching. And he tells his disciples in chapter 1, that's why I came. That's what I'm doing here. And it seems that all the other stuff that we kind of get our minds wrapped around uh, isn't the main point. All of this other stuff, all these miracles and things that happen are more like little tiny flourishes of the brush stroke uh, as, as Jesus is painting this picture. They aren't the main thing. They, 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 they aren't the likeness on the page. They're just little colors being put into the picture. The main thing was that the kingdom has, had come, that he was the son of man, that this everlasting kingdom was here. So all these people are coming and he's preaching in verse 3, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, the houses back then, especially for a fisherman, would not have been expansive, big. Uh, this was a very small spot. 
And four guys carrying a stretcher are just, they're not getting through the door. They're not getting to Jesus. Verse 4. When they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Shocking. You're supposed to be shocked by that. Because Jesus was going around healing everybody. That's what he was. He was a healer. All of chapter 1, multitudes and multitudes are coming. If you got a problem with the demon, he can do that too. Chapter 1 was expanding on what kind of authority does Jesus have. Authority over demons, authority over sickness, authority to call disciples. And yet, he does not extend his authority into the hearts of people. Even the people who have faith in him. Actually, obedience is always a choice. As we learned with the leper, Jesus didn't make him obey. What kind of authority is this? Now, I want you to... Put yourself into this tightly packed room. Everybody just dying to hear what Jesus is saying and probably dying to get their healing, their miracle done. Everybody's pressing around them. He's trying to preach the word to them. The roof gets sawn open. The roofs back then were made a lot like they are today in the Middle East. You have stone or mud um, bearing walls and then you have uh, beams that go across, and by beams I mean large sticks, and then you put smaller sticks across this way, and then you pack it all with mud and clay, and when that dries, it turns into kind of one solid thing. These guys were making a big mess. It's not like you just lift a tile out and there you go. Uh, these guys had to like dig through the roof, chop through the roof, make a hole big enough for their buddy who's lying on a map and then one guy on each corner, they lower him down till he's right in Jesus' lap. And the miracle's about to happen. The whole room is waiting with bated breath. And Jesus looks at the man and says, Son, now Jesus is 30 years old here. He says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And there's a certain amount of emotional air that goes right out of the room when someone says something crazy, you know, at the political rally or whatever, in a a room full of adults where everybody is having a good time and then somebody blurts out something that's not okay and then all the wind just goes right out of the room and people kind of go to go visit the punch bowl or be like, I don't know about that. That's what's happened here. Son, your sins are forgiven. And there's a hushed silence perhaps that falls over the entire room. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Hey, healer. Hey, preacher. Hey, exorcist. Know your place. Son, your sins are forgiven? You think you're just going to take the place of the entire temple apparatus that God had given to us? That you're just going to replace it? No sacrifices, no nothing? You just wave your hand over someone and say, they're gone. All your sins are gone. Why does this man speak this blasphemy? It's blasphemy. This is not Jesus just just having a good time and skating on the edge of, of, of acceptable theology. This is Jesus either saying that sins are not in the realm of God or Jesus is saying, I'm God. And either way, uh, he appears to be wrong to the crowd. Because in Psalm 51, David clearly states That when we sin, no matter who it's against, against you and you only have I sinned. 
You might be able to get forgiveness from a person. You might be able to do that. Say you're sorry, give them a gift, act penitent, and that person against whom you sinned might say, I forgive you. But the deal's not done then. Your righteousness has not been restored. Maybe your relationship with that person has been set on the right track, but every sin is against God and God alone. Only He can forgive. Otherwise, otherwise the gospel would sound something like this. If you account for all of the wrongs done in your life, and you find all of the people that you have wronged, and you make amends, then you can be righteous. But that is not the case. Because all sins come before God. Now listen, you can't buy God off. You can't. God doesn't care about whatever kingdom of cash you're sitting on, what position of power you are in, how much good you can do. God is just and He is mighty and His ways are higher than ours and you can't buy God off. All of our sins remain unless God forgives. That is the only way that we can be released for, from our sins. You cannot be released from your sins by doing good. Doing good does not get you out of bad. The bad is still there. Our sins still cling to us because they can only be forgiven by God. The scribes, the Pharisees, they are right about that. Only God can forgive. Was Jesus blaspheming? Well, only if he's God is he not blaspheming. Verse 8, and immediately Jesus, so put yourself back into that house, Jesus has just blurted something out very socially, theologically, politically awkward. There's this guy on a mat staring Jesus in the face, uh, he's not going anywhere. Maybe he's swinging back and forth a little bit. Jesus has just said, son, your sins are forgiven for you. The, the hush falls over and, and the scribes and Pharisees are looking at him with, with contemptuous and murderous eyes. And Jesus says, verse 7, uh, excuse me, in verse 8, immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? Can I ask you that question this morning? Which one's easier to say? Well, they're both easy to say, but which one's harder to do? Well, to the Pharisees. I think they are quite a lot like us in the fact that they were sort of dismissing the forgiveness of sins and going, where's the miracles, buddy? Did Jesus Christ come on earth in order to do miracles, to make sure that we had enough miracles? There weren't enough. God thought, gosh, if only the people had enough miracles, then the problem would be solved. Jesus, go down there and do a bunch of miracles, then everything will be okay. No, Jesus Christ did not come to do miracles. He came as the Son of Man to forgive sins. That's what he came to do. That is the most powerful thing that the God-man could have done. Lots of people work miracles. The miracles were just so that the people would believe. That's all they were for. So which is easier? Your sins are forgiven? Or son, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. Now, if I was Jesus, I'd be like, and on Tuesday, you come back and fix that nonsense. I'm staying here. Verse 10, Jesus says, but that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Don't let the on earth go by you. This is not, hey, at the end of time, the Son of Man will be there, you know, when, when the final judgment to go, hey, no, 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 let's forgive that guy. No, 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 let's forget. No, no, no. Right now, here on earth, in this body, in this moment, right now, your sins can be forgiven. I mean, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm preaching a little better than you're listening. 
I said, right here, right now, on this earth, in this moment, your sins can be forgiven. Thank you. This is, this is, if, even though this guy could have gotten up off of his mat and run down the road and danced and lived a fulfilling life, he still would have been guilty before God. And Jesus is like, son, your sins are forgiven. I just have to think, just as someone who's had just a little brush with sickness, I have to think that this guy, laying on his bed as a paralytic, unable to do anything but think and look around, had to have been haunted. What did I do to deserve this? What's my life going to look like? Am I always going to be a strain on my family? Here it takes four guys to move him around. And maybe they prop him up at the city gate to beg for things and at the end of the day come and get him and he's wondering like, God, is this what you want for me? Maybe he was a man whose heart was passionate for God in some previous time and now he felt far, far from God like his prayers did nothing. Like he really, if he could have only one thing that maybe just being close with God would be enough. I, I don't think that this man was disappointed when Jesus said to him, son, your sins are forgiven. I think there was probably a sigh of relief. I think he probably believed it. And, and I think that, that probably that was enough for him. But it wasn't enough for the Pharisees. He wanted the Pharisees to know that as the Son of Man, he didn't come just to do miracles. The miracles are non-essential. They're just to prove to hard-hearted people who don't believe that God wants to forgive sinners that he does. So, he turns to the paralytic. Verse 11, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And I just want you to see the paralyzed guy sitting right there in Jesus' lap, and Jesus talking to the Pharisees, and then face right next to the paralytic says, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose. And immediately, immediately, not later, immediately, he picked up his bed and went out before them all. So that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Boy, people crowded him out. He could not get in. But after Jesus had healed him, they made way. And, and, and people were totally, totally blown away. What does this say about faith? I, I think that the book of Mark is just, is just, um, throwing a, a, a couple of gems our way if we care to bend down, to stoop down, and pick them up. What does this say about faith? Did this man have faith? Well, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't express his faith in any way, and yet his friends, his friends expressed their faith, and they expressed their faith by bringing their friend to Jesus. Jesus was moved by the faith of the friends. Because I think, on some level, Mark is giving us a hint that faith is about doing whatever you have to do to be near Jesus. But that's what faith is. Jesus is getting this small crowd around him, but especially the scribes and Pharisees, to focus. To focus on his mission as the Son of Man to restore broken sinners to himself. That's what he's doing. He has the authority to do it. And that's what he's going to do. I think it's easy for us as Christians who have become familiar with the forgiveness of God to brush it off like that's not the big deal. And if so, we are making the mistake of the scribes and the Pharisees who were hard-hearted when we go to a prayer meeting or a church service and we say, God, it would be great to see some sort of sign from you. It's been so long. 
to seek, to seek the expression of the Holy Spirit is not a bad thing. But to say, Holy Spirit, what we really want is this. When Jesus told us plainly in the book of John that, that the entire purpose of the Holy Spirit is to convict the sinner that they might see Jesus and his righteousness and be drawn to him so that they too might be made righteous. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. And we ought to not only see that, but pursue that. Let me ask you this question. This one's just a freebie. I'm not going to go into just something for you to ponder. Let me ask you this. If, if all your sin were forgiven... All of it, really and truly, all of your sin were forgiven. Every bad thing you've done, every bad thing you're going to do, if here, right now, on the earth, you knew for sure that the Son of Man had forgiven all of your sins, you did not have one thing to prove before God, how would that change your life? Do you think that would cause you to seek Jesus more or less? Let's move on to uh, to point number two. So kids, number one was, why does this man speak blasphemy? Verse 13, he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now, we think that um, that there's two names for uh, Matthew, the apostle, and Levi is one of them. And as he reclined at table in his house, so now he's at Levi's house, and he's reclining at the table, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Just, this is going to shock you, because Jesus is a preacher, He's a super holy guy. He's all telling people to repent from their sin, to turn, to believe in the gospel. He's claiming to be the son of man, but he's also declaring forgiveness for sins. And I think without the Holy Spirit, when someone says, um, you've got forgiveness, without the Holy Spirit, we go, how dare you? How dare you Like impugn, like I need forgiveness. But with the Holy Spirit, we hear, hey, there's forgiveness. And we go, really? <laughs> like, because I, I need it. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees were there more to check and see, is Jesus a good thing or a bad thing? He's a preacher, and we, we didn't send him. He didn't graduate from one of our schools. Who is this guy? And he kind of has this screwed up theology. Now he's claiming to be the son of man. We're not too sure about him. But there's all these sinners. There's all these people standing around at the seashore. All these poor people. All these, these uh, tax collectors who are taking advantage of the poor people. Drunks, winos, prostitutes. Uh, the discard, the refuse of society. And... Jesus points to probably the chief among them, the guy who's got bags of money. He's been allowed by the government to extort people along the way. As long as the government gets its share, they let, let him take a cut. He's a traitor to the Jewish people. Um, and uh, he is here collecting taxes. And Jesus walks up to him and says, follow me. Now, what's crazy is, he does. Levi does. He gets up and follows Jesus. Leaves the sacks of money at the table, apparently, and just follows Jesus and goes, hey, why don't you come to my house? Let's have a party. Let's have a party. They're all sitting there around a lavish meal, and there's lots of tax collectors are coming. Lots of sinners are coming. Verse 16, and the scribes of the Pharisees, or scribes and Pharisees, depending what you're... Uh, uh, translation says, when they saw that he was eating with sinners, tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Kids, this is number two. Why does he eat with sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. 
I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus knows they're sinners. Everybody knows they're sinners. The sinners know they're sinners. Sinners are around the table going, hey, I'm a sinner. What's up? How far away from God do you have to be when you're like, yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm proud of it. And yet, Jesus made friends with them. Yet, Jesus cared about them. Now, Jesus' people, the, the guys who were in the God game, the guys who, like me, were preachers and teachers, they had studied, and they're out there uh, trying to like um, uh, help people become a little bit more holy. Now, here's this guy who's a preacher like them, that kind of stuff, except he's got way more power than them, and he's going and hanging out with the wrong people. How would you feel if I was down at the casino sharing drinks and, 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 and not just like, not just like where the old retired people are pressing the button over and over and over again, but like where the tweakers and the prostitutes and that, like I'm making friends with them. If you saw me in there making friends with all of these people, how would you feel? Probably like, uh, you ain't Jesus, pastor. You probably got to watch out who you're rubbing elbows with. What is Christ's response? He says, they're sick. I'm the doctor. They're sinners. I offer them righteousness. You see, all of the people who were dirty sinners, the scribes had gotten into the habit of looking down their nose at them. Thank God I'm not you. Thank God I have God. Thank God I know the rituals. I know the law. Thank goodness that I can go and be with God and be holy and I can't wait till you get yours. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm righteous, but I came for sinners. I'm here to rescue them, not condemn them. Jesus Christ loved Levi. He loved Matthew, even though he was doing the wrong thing. He loved the prostitutes. He loved the, the people who were, who were drunk, the people who were stealing, the, the thieves, the, the barbarians, the murderers. He, he loved them and he knew that the only way for them to get back to God was him. I'll say it this way. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was used to exclude people. The righteousness of Christ was used to include people. And none of that sin got on Jesus. Jesus was not soft on sin. He was a wild-eyed preacher who told people, repent, get away from your sin. It's, uh, the time is now, the kingdom is now. And yet, he was soft on sinners. He always, when he met people, he gave them an upward call. He believed in them. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And that's not a big deal. That's a regular thing. And a lot of um, mature believers uh, get into the habit of fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is when you go without something for a period of time in order to connect with God. And uh, usually it's food. You go without food for a certain period of time. You can fast from a good many things, but, but what they would do is usually do a daily fast um, once a week, something like that, and uh, they're preparing their hearts to, to be with God. If you uh, get to a place in your life where you feel like, um, God, at one time we were close. I felt like the Holy Spirit was burning inside me. Uh, we were working hand in glove, but now I feel so detached. We need you so badly, God. We need you so badly. I need you more than food today. And instead of eating, I will pray. That's what fasting is. It's a good thing. Fasting is um, an expression of faith. You're saying, I believe that God wants me like I want God 
and that by me demonstrating my desire for him, he will come and meet me. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees, they were doing this. They were fasting. And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? This is different. This is not the scribes coming in and saying, you're not doing it right. This is people being genuinely confused. Look, we know the holy church people over here, and they do business this way, and you guys aren't doing business like them. You don't look like them. How can God be using you if you are not looking like the people that God uses? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Uh, the short answer is Jesus is like, um, fasting is for getting close to God, and, well, <laughs> why should my disciples be fasting when I'm here. What's, what's the purpose? I'm right here. I'm here. Now, there's going to come a day when I go away, and then they'll be fasting. But right now, son of man, anybody? Now he's going to say something slightly different in verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, new from the old, and a worse tear is made. This is like unshrunk, unshrunk jeans. Uh, if you get a hole in them, and uh, you, these are old jeans that, that have been through the washer a few times, they've been shrunk down, then you go buy new denim, and you precisely cut out the patch and sew it in there, then the next time that garment goes through the wash and the patch shrinks, it's going to shred, the hole's going to be made even worse. What's Jesus saying? Well, he's saying, uh, the fasting bit, the Pharisees, the, your bit, that's a garment, and that garment is worn out. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus. That's what he came for. And his disciples were supposed to be doing the same thing. Now, why aren't you doing things like us, Jesus? You've got it backwards. You're the old garment, I'm the new garment. Your old garment has holes in it. We're not going to take my stuff and sew it onto yours to keep yours going. The purpose has been fulfilled. The garment is old. He'll give us a, 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 another one here in verse 22. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. This particular verse uh, uh, parable has been gone over so many times and said to mean so many things. I remember when uh, we were in youth group, and instead of Bible study, uh, we had a Mountain Dew chugging contest. And um, this particular verse was used to justify it, that a new thing is being done. You don't put new wine into old wineskins. I don't think that's what this verse means. Uh, I think that Jesus is saying God is doing a new work. And, and, and um, when he has done a work in your life, you have some ministry, some something, that is kind of like between you and God, and it has its own purpose. When it gets worn out, you don't need to take someone who God has given a different purpose to and try to sow them to your thing. Jesus is doing his own thing, and his disciples are kind of wild here. They're sinners. They're just being forgiven. They don't know how to fast well. They don't, and if you try to force them into that, it's going to wreck their souls. So stop it. They need to walk around with Jesus for about three years. They're going to be not heads the whole way. They're not going to get it. They're going to run away when he's crucified. But after he resurrects and gathers them all back together again and gives them the Holy Spirit, they'll be in prime fighting shape to start the church. So, kids, number three, why do his disciples not fast? Well, being near Jesus seems, it seems, 
like a requirement for future fasting. These disciples who were near Jesus, everything in its time, not all spiritual practices are for the moment. Faith is about getting near Jesus. Jesus is about coming for sinners. Now Jesus is here, we need to get near him any way we can. Don't let spiritual practice come in the way. What it looks like isn't the most important thing. Here is, I think, the the craziest thing that Jesus, Mark is pointing out about Jesus. That this man, Jesus, is actually the Son of Man. That he actually has come. That he's come now to these people in the story right here. Now, we get to see it from a bird's eye view. We get to see this story playing out and make sense of it. The people in the story at the time didn't have what we have now, which is this perspective, this hindsight. But the kingdom was right now. God's heartbeat to restore his people, to forgive, to be with those who have wandered far, far, far away from him. They really need him. Jesus has really come. What will we do with the presence of the Son of Man this very morning? Whether we're sinners, saints, somewhere in between, whether we feel close to God or far away, like we have lots of business that needs attending to spiritually or very little, People were all over that map when Jesus came in. But there's, there's sort of a universal reaction. It goes two different ways. Either you draw near to Jesus or you draw away from Jesus. And I'm here to tell you this morning that the Son of Man is present today, right now. Your sins don't have power over you to keep you from Him. Your sickness, your struggles, they, they, they cannot, they cannot keep you from the dominion of the Son of Man. In fact, we are oftentimes the biggest enemy to our own interaction with Jesus. We say, well, I don't need Him. Well, I'll do it later. Well, I'm having fun. But Jesus has for us something greater. If you could think about the person of Levi and where he was stuck at next to the sea collecting taxes, it was a good gig. It wasn't hard work. He got lots of money. But Jesus wanted something more for him. And he could not have it unless he got up from his table and followed Jesus. And the sinners who were dining with Christ, they all had a choice to make. Will I abandon my sins and follow this son of man? Or will I not? And they all reacted differently. We'll keep going through Mark, but how they reacted is different from how you're going to react. Because you are the one who gets to choose that. What does it look like to get near Jesus this morning? For you, you personally. What does it mean to come before the Son of Man? Whether you were the paralyzed person and your friends drug you here this morning. Sorry, that was a joke. Or you're just a sinner who likes to be around party people. Or you're a spiritual person who's... All of those things are good, they're fine. What are you going to do with Jesus calling you this morning? And I'm asking you, I'm begging you, please, abandon your sin, abandon all the other stuff, and between you and the Lord, say yes. Receive whatever forgiveness you need in your life and start following Him. Let's pray.
Jesus, sometimes it is easy to imagine that we are somehow different than the scribes, than the paralyzed man and his friends, than Levi, than the sinners. But all of them, in their own way, were somewhere on the map of humanity, separated by God, from God somehow. And you came, Lord Jesus, to break down every barrier. You came to call every sinner. You came to restore, to build, to heal, to become master of a kingdom that has no end. And we this morning, Jesus, have an opportunity to say yes to you. I pray that each and every person here would, in their in their own way, say, yes, Lord. I pray for myself that I would take the time and have the desire to simply be near you, Jesus. I ask that you would use the book of Mark in our lives, these stories, to help us shape how we think about you and, and, and how surprising you can be even in texts that are thousands of years old. So we, we pray that you would bless the reading, the preaching, and the doing of your word. Help us, each and every one of us, to grab a hold of it and, and to respond to you, Lord. Amen.